Uh, but when looking at businesses as to whether they're good businesses, mediocre businesses, poor businesses, look at the return on net tangible assets. Hey guys, this clip from the 2011 Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting is an excellent uh, insight into how Warren Buffett thinks about acquisitions and how he thinks about goodwill or the excess of purchase price over the underlying capital in the business. Uh, I'm going to be pausing this at certain steps and uh, expanding upon what Buffett's talking about here. And I'm also going to include the actual figures and show you how he looked at the Lubrizol acquisition in 2010, 2011. Let's take a look. Basically, in evaluating the businesses we own, in terms of what the management are doing and what the underlying economics of the business are, forget about goodwill. In terms of evaluating the job we're doing and allocating capital, you have to include goodwill because we paid for it. Okay, so what's going on here? There are two things that Buffett is pointing to. You have the actual company itself, and then you have the acquirer, in this case, Berkshire Hathaway. So what, what Warren is saying here is that the company itself operates independent of its parent company. So if Berkshire Hathaway pays an additional amount of money for that business, in this case, uh, Lubrizol, Lubrizol does not automatically get additional capital to work with. It only has the underlying capital that is in that business. And that's going to be important in a minute. Well, on Lubrizol, we're paying uh, close to $9 billion uh, for the equity, and it earns, and you should make adjustments for debt, but it's not an important factor there. So I just want to stop right here. Warren made this comment almost in passing, but it's important to really expand upon this. So when you're looking at the business itself, Berkshire looks at the company as if it were 100% equity finance. So what Warren's saying is, you can't just look at the equity. You have to look at all of the capital employed in the business, and that includes debt. So he's saying in Lubrizol's case, uh, there was a small amount of debt. Uh, it was pretty small relative uh, to the purchase price. Uh, he, he ignored it, I think, for simplicity's sake. Uh, but it, it's very important to recognize that all of the funding sources of a business should be considered when evaluating the fundamental attractiveness of that business. And we're, you know, the current rate of earnings is probably a billion pre-tax. And now Lubrizol itself is employing far, you know, they're, they're employing, uh, you know, call it uh, you know, two, two and a half billion uh, of equity to earn that billion of pre-tax. So it's a very good business in terms of the assets that are employed, but when we end up paying the premium we pay to buy into it, it becomes a billion pre-tax on something close to nine billion. Uh, you have to judge us based on on close to a nine billion dollar investment. You have to judge James Hambrick in running the business based on the much lower capital that that uh, he has been employed. It's it, it can turn out to be a very good business, and we can turn out to have made. Uh, at least a minor mistake uh, if it isn't as good a business uh, as we think it is now, but still, still is a very satisfactory business based on the tangible capital employed. So we'll just stop right here and take a look at the figures that are on the screen. Again, these are simplified and not based um, on the precise figures of Lubrizol, but it really drives home the point. So we can see that Lubrizol, James Hambrick, has a business that is earning 40% pre-tax on capital. That is a phenomenal business. Uh, but we can also see that because Berkshire paid this premium for Lubrizol, it's going in return is far lower. Uh, so th the way you can actually uh, figure this, you know, in this case, if you took the 9 billion, this judgment base that I've called it, divided by the 2.5 billion, that multiple, you just divide that, the 40% by that and get the 11%. So it's all related. Now, another related point to this is that the reinvestment of 
additional capital in this business. So if Lubrizol can grow, the capital required to grow this business, if they can get returns that they've been getting in the past, is on the base of the business itself. So any future capital employed in Lubrizol, they don't have to pay the goodwill again. And this is a very important point because it means that Berkshire can, can pay a higher price for a business and then sort of grow into a higher future return over time. So if Lubrizol can earn 40%, uh, 30%, even 20% on capital, Berkshire's initial going in return of 11% will get dragged higher to that reinvested return. Um, of course, the business can change fundamentally itself, uh, but looking at the history of Lubrizol, the excellent returns it re uh, earned in the past and its, its recent history, chances uh, were good then and continue to be good that the actual business itself uh, will continue to be a good one. In this next clip, Buffett talks about a imp very important related uh, part to this is the amortization of goodwill. So you hear him talk about how the uh, future uh, write-off of goodwill uh, on a regular basis, which accounting rules don't require anymore, does not have any impact uh, on the underlying business, on the attractiveness. You can add that back. But as he talks about writing off goodwill when there's a permanent impairment, like we saw in 2020 with precision cast parts, does make sense. So I'll let Buffett uh, talk for himself. Here. I, I don't think the amortization of goodwill uh, makes any sense. Uh, I think write-offs of it, when you find out you've made the wrong purchase and the business doesn't earn commensurate with the tangible assets employed and, and plus the goodwill, I think write-offs of it uh, makes sense. Uh, I hope this video really drove home the point uh, that just like when you buy a, a stock, uh, the, the difference between uh, what the underlying company is doing and the stock return can diverge. And just what, like when Berkshire buys a business in its entirety, uh, that does not change the underlying business itself. Um, and hopefully it gives you an insight into uh, why Berkshire is comfortable paying higher multiples for these good businesses. Uh, and I hope it can help you in your own investing as well. Uh, so please, uh, if I missed anything, if you have any questions on this, if you have any other questions in general, please let me know. I'd be happy to, uh, to answer them in the comments, maybe even do a video on them. Uh, so thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Um, I think you're supposed to ring a bell too. All of that good stuff. Really appreciate you tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time. Stay rational.